Sante and Jamie at the Ursula Franklin Academy here in Toronto. Today we're taking Degrassi group chats on the road with a discussion about gender identity in the media. Are you ready? I'm ready. Let's do it. Yeah, so today we're going to be talking about gender identity. Um, on the show, Degrassi, my character Yael kind of goes through a transformation where she starts questioning her gender identity. She's not really sure um, exactly what it is that she's feeling. So she goes on this whole transformation with the help of her friend Lola um, and in the end discovers that she's in fact gender fluid and kind of makes that transformation to becoming her true self. So that's kind of what we're going to be chatting about here today is um, gender identity and our thoughts about it. Um, yeah. To a lot of people, gender is like not separated from sex, and to so to those people, it's like what you're like assigned at birth. But or how I understand sex is like it's female and male, so that's like your genitals, and then gender is like how you identify, and it's really like there's no rules. As a woman who identifies as, as a girl fully, I ha didn't really understand the full spectrum of gender and how in-depth and how different it can really be. And then when I kind of started this journey with Yael, I realized that it was a lot more than just girl and boy and that it's such a wide individual thing that people kind of have to come up with themselves personally as opposed to just conforming to what it is that society tells them to be. Yeah, I think um, it was very eye-opening for everyone involved, like even when we were filming the scenes, like it was just very eye-opening. We all learned so much um, because, I don't know, it was something personally I was never really exposed to growing up, um, but it was so nice to be able to like lay it out on the table and just be able to talk about it. It was awesome. Yeah, um, I think it's really good to see that just because like you're not, like I feel like I'm in a special situation just because of my school and everything like we do, we're very open about that and I'm really thankful for that. But there are a lot of people like my younger brother who loves the show, like he's learned so much from that and I feel like it's kind of unfair to deprive people of seeing that so it should be more kind of like present in media and definitely in TV shows and stuff just because it's easier to educate people from something that they're interested in because they're more likely to listen to it and kind of like understand it more. Totally. Both times Degrassi has shown trans characters it's been uh, transmasculine folks or folks who are assigned female at birth whereas more than 90% of the media that we see of trans characters is trans feminine and assigned male at birth folks. So do you think there's underrepresentation there in female to the more masculine side? There's this kind of excitement around the idea of femininity being this constructed thing, whereas we like to see masculinity as normative. So right. it's kind of interesting that we went that way rather than the opposite way. But also towards privilege rather than away from privilege. Can you expand on that? Um, male privilege is a very real thing, and when I'm more mask presenting, mm -hmm. I definitely get that privilege more than when I'm like That's interesting. wearing heels and a dress. Like, there's definitely a distinct difference between that privilege. I think part of like the the larger like um, we see more like AMAB um, trans feminine people um, is because I think it fits more neatly into a lot of other tropes. Yeah. Um, so like you have like the tragic like you know trans woman who like all she wants is to be beautiful and like um, very. Um, structured under the existing like gender boxes and you know it, it's easier to fit into the whole like you know trans people are so sad they're so oppressed um, how on earth can you be happy and I think that's another thing I noticed about the um, Degrassi storyline is that um, as far as we saw it has a bit of a happier you know, tone to it, um, so that's definitely good. Well, I think what the Degrassi writers were trying to kind of achieve with the storyline was to, to get away from that, um, always the stereotype of, oh, the trans or the non-binary characters are the tragic characters. Okay, so we were just talking about Hunter's reaction to the whole situation. How do you guys feel about his reaction towards Yell's whole transition? So true. I dislike Hunter. While it's horrible that he reacted that way, I think it's good that he wasn't just like the accepting boyfriend. But Miles is bisexual, I was right? just going to so say, I was, like, wouldn't you think that they... his character would be more so open-minded exactly. because of having a bisexual brother? I think no. sexuality no. is so much less stigmatized than gender. Yeah. yeah. A lot of like cisgender, cis meaning like someone who isn't trans, yeah. um, like queer people can 
still be quite transphobic. Yeah. Um, and like, I think that like in this scenario, like with Hunter, like it's very like realistic because in like any situation, you're always gonna have people that are like not on board, even if it they shouldn't have a say and it's your identity, you're always gonna have like naysayers. Um, which is unfortunate, but like it's just the way it is. And yeah. with like queer people or like gay and lesbian and bisexual people not being as accepting as people would assume they would be, I feel like that's because there is so much more representation of gay people in media, like, and there has been for like yeah. a l much longer than there has been for like trans people. And so gay people assume that like, oh, our problems are like better than they used to be. Mm -hmm. Why, like everyone, that means everyone's is. If someone feels like they do not have privilege, then they feel like they are, if they're oppressed enough, then why do they need to care about other folks' oppressions? Yeah. Um, which is a bit of a weird mindset to have in my view, but um, I think you see it even with, with trans people, like regarding like racialized folk. Um, like, I don't know, I just think very often people will take their own um, identities and their own oppression and like use it as an excuse almost not to care about other people. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know about you, but for a very long time, the only trans representation we saw was medicalized programming. And then even when you saw movies or television, it was still medicalized. And so I think it's really interesting to see that it not gets, it's not a medicalized program. It's just, I'm just being me. Like how many years ago did Grey's Anatomy have that weird little like, there was an intersex person and then it was like, she has to choose oh, her yeah. gender. Like that I was so that. wild. Like They've had a couple of, yeah, Grey's yeah. Anatomy. They also, House. Um, one of the character's brothers uh, was transgender, so um, was wanting to be a woman. And they literally, it was all medical. Like they just kept yeah. her in a hospital bed the entire time and we we're just there's like. There's no storyline outside. There's no, the exactly. I find exactly. also that like most uh, trans representation in like TV and movies or the media in general, it, all trans people always have surgery. Like it's not even an option presented to them of not getting surgery. Exactly. But that has like super real consequences too because I remember when I was like um, about two years ago when I was thinking I might be trans, I remember thinking well I don't ever want to have surgery so like I can't. But yeah. like and yeah. it, w it took me a super long time. Yeah. Like it was just a few months ago that I came out as like he. And a bit it gets it gets to like a psychological point as well because like if you never see yourself reflected in positions of power or in successful positions or even just being happy then you're led to believe that it's not possible for someone like you. So when you see something like that you'd like to see that represented in the media. So now how do we balance the kind of struggles that um, gender uh, non-binary people face and trans people face without making them the tragic character? Well I found Orange is the New Black like in the first season maybe actually did that I think relatively well in that um, Sophia Lauren Cox's character wasn't was being denied access to medical treatment, mm -hmm. so she was like just not having any of it, um, and just like really fought super hard. And I thought that sort of showed, um, you know, that being trans isn't all like you know sunshine and daisies all the mm -hmm. time, but it also isn't you know like helpless and. Totally. Um, she wasn't powerless in that situation. When it was presented to me that I was gonna be playing a genderqueer character, it required a lot of research for me. And I didn't really know what gender fluid or genderqueer meant. And I think that that's a fault of not just the media, but our society in general, because we're not kind of given the resources to understand from a young age that this is something that people go through and it's normal. And even though I haven't gone through it personally, I think that it's kind of a red flag that it, I had to do so much research just to kind of understand the basis of this, when this is what people are living and this is what people are going through. Yeah. Whether they are classified as educational or not, the shows that like younger and older kids are watching. Mm -hmm. Like, if I had been eight years old and there had been a trans character on Hannah Montana, mm -hmm. boy, like mm -hmm. I probably would have been so much happier, so much quicker. Plus, by like giving like younger kids like access to this like mm -hmm. programming, mm -hmm. it also will eventually, hopefully, take away heteronormativity yeah. and like um, cis normativity because. Like, mm -hmm. right now, it's like s straight until proven gu like gay. Were you going to say straight until proven guilty? Guilty as charged.
hard. Yeah. <laughs> um, but like, if you have representation of mm -hmm. like gay people and trans people and non-binary people in the media for younger age groups, yeah. then that like eliminates that. So as we saw Lola help yell out uh, in the whole situation on the show, how do you think that cis allies could help out in real life, like in real schools? How do you think that they could help make the transition easier or just life easier in general? I think one of the most basic, basic things is just don't misgender people yeah. and use the correct name for someone, even if you're used to a different name. Um, and some people just don't seem to get it. And I mean, like, if you're really struggling or if you don't understand something, like, ask, but like, please don't, like, put, Assume. yeah. <laughs> and, and don't put my own, like, mental health at risk because of what's convenient for you. Yeah. I mean, my favorite one is when you meet someone for the first time, go, hi, my name's Teika, I use they, them. What's your name? And that gives a person, A, their name, and B, you've gone, hi, my pronoun is. So their response is, ah, yes, I share my pronoun back. Some people just look at you weird. Okay, yeah, <laughs> but. Yeah, I've started asking, like when I introduce myself to new people, I've started asking pronouns and giving mine, because like, I didn't used to, I'm like, I'm cis, like, people assume that I'm a girl, mm -hmm. except for one time in an airport. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but like, it's not something that occurred to me growing up, like, I need to make sure people call me the right thing. Yeah. Um, I've realized that it's like, important for people, and if I don't say, what are your pronouns, then they might not feel comfortable giving, yeah. giving them. So how do you guys think that people could um, source or find support if they don't have it in their, in their circles or in their families or anything like that? The internet is a glorious, glorious place filled with wonderful things. Also some less wonderful things, but lots of wonderful, <laughs> wonderful things. Also, I have, um, I have a really close friend who is uh, non-binary mm -hmm. and they started like going on Tumblr and going on Instagram and making like internet friends because they find right. like there's less to hide, mm -hmm. I guess. Yeah. And so, and internet friends tend to be more accepting, especially Tumblr internet friends. <laughs> um, and a lot of people are like, oh, internet friends aren't real friends. Like, mm -hmm. but I, this friend um, calls their best friend who lives in like somewhere across the world every night because they're so close. So just touching on the internet friend thing, um, I have this friend Trisha, and I've met her once, but we did, like she lives in Germany, so it's not like we see each other every day. But I was the first person she told about her bisexuality. Like she comes to me with stuff that she doesn't tell her in real life friends, and like just because I think it's easier sometimes to talk to someone when you're not face to face. Like it's easier to, I guess, like come to terms with who you are and kind of like just be more honest when you're not like looking at someone and like fully seeing their reaction. And yeah, just like internet friends are so much more accepting just because they're like, they're there for the same reasons that you are just to yeah. be accepted. So they're like, oh, someone's like me or like kind of just like seeing that is really comforting. Mm -hmm. It's safer when they're a world away. Yeah, like, like you're I, never gonna run into them. Yeah, like even if I tell you my darkest secrets, I probably won't see you, so. Exactly. It's all it doesn't that. matter if you tell all your friends because they don't know me. Yeah. Yeah. And as well, like the internet can be really like nifty if you like um, aren't able to go to like in-person support groups or events. Like I think in Toronto, at least there are a lot of those now. But if, like if you live in a smaller area, if you just have like anxiety or you're not physically able to like go out and like do stuff, um, it's like you know a pretty simple way that you can just meet people. So how important is it to have conversations about gender identity? Incredibly important. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> but it depends who we're having those conversations with. Because when we're just having insular conversations within the queer community, especially just within the trans community, it's not getting us anywhere when we just have the same conversation when we walk in circles. Mm -hmm. yeah. We have to start asking those questions outside. And I think that's what the program is doing. That's what the program. <laughs> That's okay. That's we know what, what you mean. That's what doing. <laughs> and 
kind of that, presenting it to the that's outside world. Why it's creating conversation. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's mass media for a reason. But I think like that's a good point, and that brings up how incredibly important it is um, to have that sort of representation, like in movies and on TV, um, and as well like not just fictional characters to have like real people like represented. I don't know. My parents watch a lot of like TV shows, and they don't have anything to do with anything that's relevant. And that kind of just like, for me, is super annoying because when I do want to talk to my parents about something, like I'll talk to them like, oh, today in Young Woman's we were talking about blah, blah, blah. And then my parents would be like, oh, like, no, that's not a thing. Like, don't worry about it. And I'm like, no, like, I need to tell you. And then I, it just gets really heated. And I feel like it shouldn't because I shouldn't be, like, I shouldn't have to constantly educate my parents. Like, it's good that I can and that I have, like, that I know enough to do that. But also at the same time, like my parents should have resources, and like all parents should have resources that are like there that they're going to listen to to educate themselves because they were growing up in a time when this kind of stuff wasn't really talked about as much. I also feel like it's parents think that it's our job as kids who f care about this stuff mm -hmm. to educate our parents when in reality, if they care about what we care about or that if they care that we care, they should be educating themselves. Yeah. Yeah. That's really great points, guys, and you know, thank you so much for having this conversation with us. I think it was a really important one to have, and I hope um, Yael being now on, on TV and on Netflix and all this kind of stuff can spark more conversations like this because I think they need to go far and wide outside of just this circle. So thank you so much. This was really fun. It was so wonderful meeting all of you guys, and this is Degrassi Group Chat. <laughs> Sign up. Sign up.